OCCC. It is a blessing to be here yes. on this beautiful day. Um, not only is it the Lord's Day, but yeah, next, next slide. it is also uh, Mother's Day, which is a double blessing to worship this day. Does this work? There are a whole bunch of thumbs ups going up right now. Yeah, yeah. you got this. <laughs> uh, let me see if <laughs> presentation. Oh, presentation. What? So um, I, my calling is to be a pastor. And uh, <laughs> okay, this is not it. On plate, plate, the triangle. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Woo. Okay, so um, on, on this mode, I have no notes, so uh, please, no. uh, it is the grace of God. Um, you know, and, and that's the beautiful thing about God. Um, no matter how well we prepare, how well we do, no matter how eloquent the person or uneloquent, what is remembered, what is forgotten, um, God is able to do and move the hearts of His people. The Holy Spirit is able to speak and touch the lives and hearts of His people, regardless of how good or bad we do. And so we have an amazing God, a wonderful God, and we completely trust in Him. You want me to try? Okay. Want me to try something? <laughs> okay. okay. I, I was mirroring the... You don't want to mirror? Oh, I don't. Okay. Yeah. We got you. <laughs> yeah. Boom. Yes. Yes. <laughs> However, having both the notes and the slides are even better. <laughs> because we always want to do our best before the Lord. You know, we always want to do what we can to be as, uh, as prepared and as uh, present the best we possibly could. Uh, yes. Now, as you know, it is Mother's Day today and I had this beautiful idea of waking up my boys early in the morning and preparing breakfast and bringing it in to my wife in a, on a tray, you know, with a little flour and all that, with orange juice. And then on Instagram, I saw this slide. It said, what people think moms want for Mother's Day. And, you know, the whole slide is saying they want breakfast in bed. However, I, I swiped left and then this slide came up. What mothers actually want. They want quiet. They want peace. They want... They want two hours to themselves. They do not want breakfast in bed. So I had to change my plans and uh, I did something else. And uh, when I told my wife, she actually said she wanted the breakfast in bed. So I made her breakfast in bed today. <laughs> so she got a double blessing. Um, today's message is titled Women of Faith. Um, and if you're not a woman, it's okay. The principles are universal and they can be applied to boys, girls, men, um, anyone in general. And I'll be reading out of Exodus 2, verses 1 through 10. And I'll be reading from the ESV. So may you be blessed as you give attention to the reading of His Word. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took him she took for him a basket made out of made of bulrushes and dubbed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank, and his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. While her young women walked beside the river, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And when Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, 
and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. Amen. This is the holy and errant word of God. Thanks be to God. Our passage today begins with the beautiful love story. Man meets woman, woman marries man, boom, fine child appears. But it takes a twist. She hides him for three months, which is odd because we don't normally hide good looking children. You know, typically they become the poster child for our family. You know, look at my son, look at my daughter. They're so beautiful, they're so pretty. We take pictures of them, post it on social media, send them to friends, neighbors, to everyone to share our joy with the world. But not this woman of faith. She saw her beautiful baby boy and she decides to hide him because during this time, it was very dangerous for Hebrew boys. In Exodus 1.22, it reads that, Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. In this time, Pharaoh tried to get the midwives to do his dirty work and get rid of all the Hebrew baby boys. But when that didn't work, he made this law. He gave a command to every citizen in his kingdom that they were to toss every newborn Hebrew boy into the river. And he said this because he was afraid that if he didn't get rid of these baby boys, that one day they would grow up and join his enemies and overthrow his kingdom. Seems a bit far-fetched, doesn't it? To do away with all these babies because you think that one day they'll grow up and overthrow your kingdom. But that was the law during this time. That was the law of the land. But this woman was not a woman who was afraid. Quite the opposite. As Hebrew 11.23 says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents, because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. She was not afraid. Incredible. She knew the law. She knew what was probably going to happen for Moses. She knew the dangers that he faced. She knew the dangers that he was surrounded with, as well as the danger for her whole family if he was caught. But she was not afraid. Rather, this woman of faith was fearless. And it makes me wonder how. Because when everything is going good, when life is good, when we have money in the bank, and we have a job, a house, and all the things on our list, there's nothing to fear. But when danger surrounds us, when the world seems to be crumbling around us, how can someone be fearless? You know, I recently saw the movie After Earth. Uh, it came out a, a while back, maybe about 10, 13 years ago. It stars one of my favorite uh, actors, Will Smith. But also, it, it, he did a duel with his son, Jaden Smith. And at one point in the movie, uh, Jaden finds himself... He has to go on this mission across the jungle to get something and to bring it back to the ship that crashed on planet Earth. Now, planet Earth went through a bunch of changes. It evolved, and now everything on Earth has evolved to kill humans. So he's cold, he's hurt, he's bleeding, and there's this animal that's hunting him, and he starts to become afraid. He starts getting scared. He starts becoming fearful. He starts becoming anxious. He starts jumping at his own shadow, his heart is breathing fast, and he, he can't slow down. And then his father says something very telling to him about fear. He says this, Fear is not real. Fear is not real. The only place that fear can exist is in our thoughts of the future. It is the product of our imagination, causing us to fear things that do not at present and may not ever exist. That is near insanity. Now do not misunderstand me. Danger is very real, but fear is a choice. Fear is a choice. And when this woman of faith made a conscious choice, she made the choice not to fill her heart up with the potential dangers. 
not to fill her heart up with all the what ifs. You know, what if he cries too loud? What if, what if someone sees him? What if, what if, you know, someone smells him or hears him? No, instead, this woman of faith chose to fill her heart up with something else. She began to fill her heart up with the things of God and became fearless. Consider King David. I love King David. He's one of my favorite uh, people in the Bible. You know, next to Jesus, of course, but, you know, King David, he's, he's up there. And there was a time when Goliath came to fight against the armies of Israel. You know, Goliath's a big dude. He, he was a giant. He was a warrior from birth. And everybody in Israel was afraid of him. Even King Saul was afraid of him. Now, keep in mind, King Saul was also a head taller than everyone else. So King Saul is not a small person. But he was scared. It's like if Mike Tyson came to church and said, hey, does anybody want to go one-on-one? -on -one? Of course not. That's Mike Tyson. Nobody would want to fight Mike Tyson in their right mind. And for 40 days, Goliath came and he ridiculed every man in Israel, taunting them, laughing at them. And nobody wanted to fight him. And everyone was filled with fear. The whole nation was filled with fear. Except David. David was not afraid of Goliath. And you have to wonder why. Where did he get this courage? How could David be fearless when everybody around him was fearful? What did he fill his heart up with? You know, David was a shepherd boy. Uh, he kept hold of his father's sheep and so... You know, day and night when uh, an animal like a wolf or a lion or a tiger or something, some beast wanted to eat a sheep of his, he would run off after the sheep and kill the animal and save the sheep. But one day, David came to fight Goliath and he, King Saul was talking to him. He said, hey, are you sure you're up to fighting this guy? I mean, this guy's a giant. He's bigger than everyone. Everyone's scared. And this is what King David says in 1 Samuel 17, 37. He says, And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, you know, when he was keeping watch over his father's sheep, will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Church, dangers in life are very real. But to live in fear is a choice. And people of faith become fearless, not because they choose to ignore the dangers of life, not because they block it out or, or they're unaware of the dangers that they face, but because they fill up their hearts with the things of God. King David filled up his heart with God's power, with God's deliverance, with God's faithfulness. In a time when the whole nation was fearful of Goliath, David became fearless because he chose to fill his heart up with the deliverance that God had shown him time and time again in the past. And just like the woman of faith, she did not crumble in fear, but filled her heart up with the things of God. And she did not fear the king's edict. Oftentimes, especially in our current circumstances, situations that we find our nation in right now, we become fearful because of the potentials and the possibilities. And I'm not saying that the danger isn't real, but to live in fear is a choice. And that's not the choice for the people of God. Rather, the choice for the people of God is to fill up our hearts with the things of God of His sovereignty, of His grace, of His love, and become fearless in our time. However, as verse 3 says in our passage, there came a time when she could hide Him no longer. You know, it became impossible for her to keep Him a secret any longer. It was out of her power, out of her control. I mean, but even at this point, this woman of faith did not crumble. But she does two things. First, she takes all the wisdom and all the ability and, and all the, the things that she can do. She takes that. 
And so she goes and finds a basket made of bulrushes. Now, what bulrushes are is this is the material that they used back in the days to make boats. So she found a basket, not just any basket, but she used the wisdom and reasoning and insight that God had given her that she has, and, and she finds a basket that's going to float, that won't sink. Then, you know, she coats it with bitumen and pitch, you know, makes it waterproof so that water doesn't get in and, and pull the basket down. Then, by her wisdom and understanding, she places the basket by the reeds by the riverbank. Now, I, I didn't know what that was, so I googled that, and the riverbank is actually the sides of the river. You know, where the stream is, 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 the current is not as strong. And so it's not just a place of patch of reeds anywhere in the river, but rather it's by the sides of the river. It's just not a random patch. So if we look at this, she finds the, the best place. She uses all the wisdom, all the understanding that God has given her, and she finds the safest place, the most optimal place in which she can ensure the survival of Moses. And then she places his older sister a little further down to watch and report what would happen to him. And secondly, understand that when she places him on the river, it's not just that she's letting go and, and doing some random thing, but she's doing everything that she can do, everything within her power to do, but now she's leaving it in the hands of God. She uses all her wisdom and reasoning to do the best that she could. But now she has to take a step of trust and place Moses in God's hand. And God does not disappoint. You know, any number of things could have happened. You know, a current could have washed him away. A stray dog could have come sniffing around and picked up the basket and took off with him. You know, a... a uh, a strong wind could have pushed the basket into the, the river and carried it off into the ocean. But it didn't. And so what we see here is God's sovereign hand. God provided the right circumstances to keep Moses where he needed him to be. But he also provided the right person. How do we know that Pharaoh's daughter was the right person? First off, she saw the basket. Now, I don't know about Chinese people, but I can count on one hand how many people I've met that are Korean throughout my lifetime that do not wear glasses. What I'm saying is, if it was a Korean pharaoh daughter, she would not have seen the basket. And so God provided the right person because she was able to see. It's a bit funny, but, but just think about it. The right person. She saw the basket. Secondly, when she got the basket and she heard the baby crying, God provided the person with the right heart. Have you ever seen some people yell at kids when they're crying? That's not the right person to send. But God finds the right person. The person who can see, but the person who also has a heart of compassion, a heart of care. Not only that, he provides a person who has authority to save Moses. She was Pharaoh's daughter and she could do what she wanted. God also provides the right direction. Moses' sister just happens to be there saying, Hey, miss, um, do you want me to find someone to take care of him for you? Not only that, but God provided a way for them to be paid to take care of Moses. You know, so what does all this mean? What do all these things that God provides and that God did mean for us? On the one hand, it's a historical fact of events that happened over a period of time, a long time ago. However, on the other hand, it's the personal testimony of a woman who trusted in God. I mean, ju just think about it. During a time when there were throwing Hebrew babies into the Nile River. God saved her son, Moses. God saved him. God provided the right person at the right time with the right authority, with the right eyes, with the right heart. God did all of this 
How amazing and how wonderful and how stupendous it is of what God does. I mean, for someone to say that, look, I'm being paid to take care of a Hebrew baby boy right now during this time. It had to be the work of God. There's no other way it could have happened. You know, as I was preparing this point, I was reminded in first or second grade, I can't really remember. But what I was reminded of was when I was walking home from school with my friend, and I don't remember exactly what happened, but me and my friend fell into the hands of this really big bully, you know, about the size of, of Wesley. And, and I remember this bully was grabbing my friend on the left hand with his backpack and me on the right hand with his backpack. And he was pulling us and he, he threw us against the fence and he was going to beat us up. I, I, I don't remember if we did something to him or not. I, I don't know. I can't remember that part. But I remember being so scared and, and, you know, do I run away? Do I leave my backpack? I remember thinking, what can I do? What can I do? And the reality was this guy was huge. There was nothing I could do. And I remember crying at God, saying, God, please help me. I don't want to die. I don't want to get my teeth kicked in. God, save me. And after the guy threw us against the fence and he was about to pound us, the uh, screen door flung open. And this girl screams out, Hey, David, you put those boys down or I'm going to tell mom. Thank God. It was his sister, his little sister. But at the right time, at the right place, in the right moment, God provided the right person so that we can be saved from being beat up. Friends, this point is not for the strong. It's not for the person who is capable, who has everything. It's not for that person. Trusting in God is for the person who cannot. Yes, we do the best we can, we do the best we can, we do the best we can, but there is an inability within us that we cannot overcome, that we cannot complete it. And for everyone who does come to this point and begins to place their trust in God, they will have a glorious testimony of God's work, of God's faithfulness, of what God has done, of what God continues to do. Friends, it, it is a blessed thing to be able to have a testimony in our generation. Not simply to know things about God or to be able to quote things about what God has done in the past. But to have a living, breathing testimony that brings glory to God because we have placed our trust in Him. We have placed our hope in Him. We have placed our very life in Him. And God does not disappoint His people. Church, we're living in an unprecedented time right now, especially with the virus and with the killer Asian bees too, or the hornets. Let us not become crippled because of the dangers that exist, but let us become fearless because we fill our hearts up with the things of God, with the sovereignty of God, with the deliverance of God. And let us continue to trust in God day in and day out for the small things and the big things so that we may have a testimony about God to share with our generation. Let me pray for us. Father God, there is much that we can always do. You've given us strength, you've given us abilities, you've given us talents. But at some point, and there comes a point where our skills, our abilities, and our talents run out. And when we come to that point, O oh Lord, I pray that your Spirit would stir in us hope 
not to go to other people or other things, but to come to you like this woman of faith did in our passage. To place our hope, our trust, our life in you. So that we may see your glorious work and that we may glorify in you. Father God, I pray for all my brothers and sisters this day. Especially on this beautiful Mother's Day, O oh Lord. That we would remember and cherish who you have provided and placed in our lives. And thank you for the care that you have given us. Let us not become timid and let us not be overcome with fear. But as we fill up our hearts with your word and with your truth, let us become fearless and testify to the glory of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.